Thank you, Mary, for playing that song. That song has actually been my anthem all while I was preparing for Romans chapter 11, just being reminded of God's great faithfulness. I was praying it personally over me, but I was also praying it over all of us. As we read his word, he, we just see him so faithful. And I pray that in whatever circumstances we find ourselves in this morning, that we would trust that great faithfulness of God. Thank you for greeting me so lovingly and so heartedly when I came through the doors. I felt like I had my own little welcoming committee this morning. And so I hope you feel just as welcome to be here. Um, and I also want to welcome everyone who's watching on the live stream. I know my mom's watching from Tennessee, and I think we've got a vast, you know, audience that tune in from lots of different places. And then those of you will be tuning into the archives sometime later, we know that the Holy Spirit can meet each one of us wherever we are and whenever we're turning to God and we want to know his word. So would you open your Bibles to Romans chapter 11? And while you're getting prepared there, I just have a quick story I want to share with you. Last summer, my family and I went on a trip. We went on a hiking trip to Yosemite. And we had been hiking before. Actually, the previous year, we hiked the Grand Canyon. So in my novice little mind, I thought, oh, I've been on a, you know, a, camp, a hiking trip before. I have my boots. I've got my backpack. I've got my canteen. I've got everything I need, you know, all the essentials to get going. I had a real confident attitude because it wasn't my first time. And I have to tell you, you know, hiking the Grand Canyon, the topography, the terrain, it's mostly desert. So other than the initial descent into the canyon, and then when you leave, you got to, you know, ascend out of it, um, you know, Yosemite's different because we, you guys are laughing. Some of you have done that. You knew this. I didn't realize that we were climbing up a mountain. Okay, it's a little different, and it's a little different. And I liken this hiking, these hiking trip experiences to Bible study, because maybe you've been in Bible study before, and you thought this year, oh yeah, I've done that, I've got my Bible, got my commentary, I'm ready to go. And you're feeling like, oh my gosh, what are we doing? We've, it, we're, we're climbing a mountain this year. Okay, we are, we are doing that. And you know, at the beginning of a hike or beginning of Bible study, we're also excited, we're on our adrenaline, you know, we've got fresh legs, but then what happens as we keep going, you know, we, the elevation changes and the road gets steep and we start to get tired and that's when our resilience needs to kick in. But can I just tell you that if you continue, if you keep going, just think about the spiritual muscles of faith that you're developing as you make this climb. And when we get to the top, the view is going to be worth all the effort it took to get there. Okay, and I hope this is not a spoiler alert, but Paul is taking us to the peak at the end of chapter 11. He is taking us to the heights where we're going to see a glimpse of the view of God's redemptive plan. And I can tell you, it is breathtaking. Okay, so be ready. Um, one last thing. I read years ago that all of us have a tendency that when we begin reading our Bibles, that we ask these questions. How does this apply to me? What does this mean in my life? And we're looking at the me and the my, and you know, those are good questions, and we do want to ask those, answer those questions, but those aren't the initial questions that we need to be asking of the text. When we read God's word, the first question is, Lord, what does this teach me about you? and about your character. And then we want to remember the context in which it's written, who it's written to, and what does it mean. So if it's okay with you, that's how we're going to unpack chapter 11. We're going to see the big picture, the character of God as he talks to his people, but then we're going to glean personal application along the way. Um, I, I, I heard, I read that Chapters 9, 10, and 11 are like a parenthesis within this letter that Paul is writing. And it's a discussion that he starts back in chapter 9, and he continues. And in chapter 11, he's going to, um, he's going to continue that same conversation. But in order for us to fully understand what he's saying, 
we really need to do just a quick little overview because Paul feels like he needs to kind of stop, slow down, and just talk to the nation of Israel and his fellow Jews because there's a lot of questions that are coming up with the things that he's saying. Do you remember back in chapter 9? Chapter 9, I think the best way to, like a heading for that to remember chapter 9, is Israel's um, past election. It's, it's Israel's past election. This is where we learned how God chose Israel. He elected them. He chose them. And we read and we're reminded that it's the children of Israel that were the chosen ones. They were given that name. They were the chosen ones. They were the ones that were given God's promises. Um, the, they were given the law, the patriarchs. And it was Jesus, their Messiah, that was going to come through their lineage. And we read in Deuteronomy 7, 6, that says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you, because you were more in number, for you were the least, but because the Lord loves you, and because he would keep the oath he swore to his fathers. But somehow along the way, they got to thinking that they were special, and that's why God chose them. But that wasn't it at all. They were special because God had chosen them. Do you see the difference there? And you know, God chooses the way God always chooses. It's from his grace. It was nothing that they could earn. It wasn't because they were good enough, smart enough, better than everybody else. No, because God loved them, he chose them. And then in chapter 10, we can label this chapter Israel's present rejection. Israel's present rejection. Because although the Lord God had chosen them, they had by and large rejected their Messiah. And we read in chapter 10 where Paul's heart was just broken. He, was, he longed for his, his fellow kinsmen to know their Messiah. And he prayed for them that they would turn back to him. And the message of salvation we read had gone out to whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But instead of receiving the righteousness of God through Christ, they insisted on keeping the law. And then do you remember that beautiful picture at the end of chapter 10 where God just has his arms open and he's just waiting for his children to receive him? So you can imagine at this point that there are a lot of questions going on. And this is where Paul continues the conversation in chapter 11. And in chapter 11, we see Israel's future restoration. His future restoration. We're going to discover that just because Israel rejected God doesn't mean that God rejected Israel. Chapter 11 teaches that there's still a future fulfillment for the nation of Israel. There's coming a day, and we read it in verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. In other words, there's coming a day, according to Bible prophecy, that at the second coming, Israel will recognize their Messiah. They will see Jesus. They'll recognize him as the Messiah. They will repent and they will receive him as Savior. If you're taking notes, <clears throat> I've got three points this morning. And my first point is that God has a plan. God has a plan. And I don't know if it's just my personality, but I love plans. I love planning. I love schedules. I love when somebody has thought something through. And I've come to the point in my life that I don't even know, have to know the details of the plan, just as, I, just as long as I know there's a plan in place. And so that's how we all should be feeling. When we find out that God has a plan, he knows the details. He knows how it's all gonna, going to unfold. Sometimes he tells us a little bit about his plan, but for the most part, it's a mystery. But we can trust him because he's the one who's got the plan. And we find out here that God has a plan and that there is a remnant of believers. Let's read verse 1 and 2. It says, Has God cast away 
or maybe your Bibles say rejected, his people? Certainly not. For I am an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people, whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah? Go to verse 5. Even so then, at this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Paul was trying to comfort and to reassure them. Because they might have been wondering at this point, has God changed his mind? Perhaps he's not, you know, maybe they're doubting whether God's going to keep his promises. Despite Israel's disobedience, God had not rejected his people. And Paul points to himself as an example. You know, the, the gospel has gone out, but look, I've received this good news. Jesus is my Messiah. I'm part of that remnant. I'm exhibit A. So God hasn't, you know, God hasn't given up on us. He's part of that remnant. And that word remnant means a small believing minority that's been faithful to God. And he also uses the Old Testament example of Elijah. And again, remembering the context, he knew who he was speaking to. And those, that audience would have known exactly that story of Elijah. And I know that we were to read it in our lesson found in 1 Kings. But do you remember Elijah? Do you remember how despondent he was? I mean, he was downright depressed because he felt like he was the only one that was following God. He looked around and he couldn't see anybody else who was with him. He felt so isolated and so dejected. And what did the Lord do for him? Do you remember how the Lord came to him in that still, quiet voice? And he told him, Elijah, you're not alone. I have a remnant. I'm still working. Don't be discouraged. Trust me. And maybe your heart needs to hear that this morning. Maybe you're feeling a little bit isolated. Maybe you're looking around and feeling like you're in the minority. I was thinking about even how this applies to maybe our teenagers or um, the younger adults or even those of you that are single and are waiting to be married and you are pursuing a life of purity and maybe you look around in this sex-saturated culture that we live in and you might be doubting and questioning God and his promises and you're probably thinking, is it worth it? It is. Don't waver. God has wonderful plans. And I'm thinking about how some of us grow weary because we look around at our, the shifting sand of culture, what's politically correct, and we're thinking to ourselves, we're trying to live by the principles and the standards and the absolutes of God's word. Am I the only one? But I want you to look around, look to your left, look to your right. We are not alone. We come here to be encouraged, to be strengthened so we don't waver. In the, in, in the promises of God. He is faithful, and we need to continuously remind ourselves of his faithfulness. So what does this teach us about God? It teaches us that he has a plan, that he's trustworthy, that he will not forsake his own, and that he is faithful. 2 Timothy 2.13, it says that if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. In Psalm 94, 14, it says, The Lord will not reject his people. He will not abandon his special possession. <clears throat> and like Abraham in Romans 4, 21, we don't want to waver at the promise of God, but we want to be fully persuaded that God has the power to do what he had promised. The other morning, um, I asked my husband if he needed a refill of coffee. And I walked over to him. He was working on his laptop. And I said, do you, do you need me to refill your coffee? And he said, yes. And then as I was about to pour, I said, do you trust me? Now, those of you that know me best know that I struggle with my eyesight. And I have a real issue with depth perception. And nine times out of 10, when I'm pouring my own cup of coffee on a flat surface, I spill all the time. So as I'm ready to pour him some coffee over his computer, do you trust me? And this is what he said. He said, well, I trust your intention, <laughs> just not your ability. <laughs> and it sounds, it sound, it's, he said it so kind. He didn't say it harsh at all. But you know, as soon as he said it, I thought, oh, 
How many times do I think that about the Lord? Where I trust the Lord's intention, but maybe not his ability. And it kind of plays out like this. Sometimes I'll be praying and I'll say, oh God, I know you love me. I, I, I know you love me. And I know you want what's best for me. But this issue, this circumstance, this trial, this, this difficulty that's in front of me, it just seems so big. I just don't know how you're going to work all of this out. And we doubt his ability, right? We put him in a box. Just because we can't figure it out, we think that God can't figure it out. But he is transcendent. He's above all things. He sees all things. He knows the end from the beginning, the beginning from the end. He knows how things work. So we can trust him. Or we say things like, um, well, uh, let's see. Um, what's my other example? Um, we trust his ability no, we trust, oh, I know it is. We, <laughs> we doubt maybe his, his intention for us. Like, we can look at somebody else's issue and we go, oh, I'm going to pray for you. God can work that out. God can do that for you. And somehow we just, we, we, we feel we have all this faith for somebody else. Oh, God can do that. That's not too hard for him. But then, but then we question whether he'll do it for us. But if any of you are feeling that way this morning, can I just remind you that God's intention for you is always for your good. His intentions are good. And as far as his ability, nothing is too hard for him. Nothing is impossible with God. And, you know, I look around and I see such women of faith. And I'm desperate to become a woman of faith. And I've come to the point in my life where I realize that it's when I get to a circumstance and, a, and an issue in my life where I cannot figure it out that I have to just get to that point and say, Lord, I am going to trust you in this. I'm not going to tell you how you need to figure it out. I'm not going to help you in this situation. I'm simply going to give it to you believing that because you promised, you will fulfill your promise. And it's when we can do that, in the scariest of times, that's when God's going to build that muscle of faith in each one of us. That's how he's going to be answering our prayer to make us women of faith. And I'm sure that a lot of thoughts were going through these believers' minds, this early church, because they're trying to wrap their minds around how, how can God keep his promise to Israel if the majority of Israel has rejected God. But we see that God is a promise maker and he's a promise keeper. And I love that it's God who takes the initiative. When he makes the promise, he's the one taking the initiative and he's the one with the power and the authority to fulfill and to bring to fruition that which he promised. We all know the verse, Jeremiah 29, 11, right? For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans that are good, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. But do you know where the real sweetness and the real strength of that verse is? Is when you consider the context of it. Because God's giving a promise to his people while they're in captivity. They're taken captive to Babylon. They are not in their homeland, and yet they're longing to go back home. They're in a place that they don't want to be. Their hands are tied. They don't have a lot of choices here. And yet God comes, and he gives them this promise, this future fulfillment. And he tells them, you're going to be here for a while, but I've got a plan. And we know that God answered that, right? And they were brought back to the land. That's an Old Testament fulfillment. But here we find in the New Testament, in this chapter, that God is saying that there is going to come a day when the Jews would receive their Messiah. And it seems impossible, but that's the plan. So what happened to Israel? When we read verses 7 through 10, it tells us that because of their unbelief, they became blinded and hardened. Which begs the question in verse 11 that says, so were they a lost cause? And the answer is no, they're not. In verse 11 it says, did they stumble so far as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. Or maybe your Bible translation says to make them jealous. In other words, they stumbled, 
but they didn't completely fall so hard or so far that they wouldn't be able to get back up again. God is going to give them another opportunity, but for now, they've been set aside. You see, God held open the door originally for his people, the Jews, to come in, but they refused to enter. But that doesn't mean that the door is closed. But who's entering through that door? Isn't it you and me? It's the Gentiles who are, who are receiving and, and going through that door and answering the call of salvation. But the Bible is saying that that door is still left open and that Israel will one day in God's plan walk through. So Israel's rejection at this point has become the Gentiles' salvation. What a plan. This is God's plan. It's mind-boggling, but this is his plan from the very beginning. So what does Paul mean in verse 14 when, when he says, If by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. See, because of Christ, we have become spiritually rich. We're rich with all the benefits of salvation. Forgiveness, peace, joy, hope, purpose. And when outsiders see the fullness of our lives, it should draw them in. I have a personal question that I want to ask you that I asked myself as I was reading this. As a believer, are others drawn to us because of Christ living in us? Does anybody want what you have? I was thinking about how believers and non-believers alike all go through hard times. We all have difficulty and, and hardships and go through trials. But what if, as a believer, we would trust God in the most critical circumstances? What if we prayed? What if we didn't fall apart like the rest of the world who doesn't have a God to lean on and to depend on and to cry out to and to trust in? Wouldn't that, when other people saw our faith, wouldn't that draw them to us? Or what if we were so loving and so kind and so gracious and if people heard us talk and our speech would be so sweet to them that they would want to be our friends. There would be something about us that they would just want to have a relationship with us. And they might say something to you like, oh, I'm just drawn to your energy. You've got just good energy. Have, has anyone ever heard that before? Yeah, and I think it's because they're just trying to figure out in their own vernacular what it is that there's something different about you. But it wouldn't be so great if we could get them close enough and we could tell them the source of that joy and that love and that peace and that hope that we have and we can say it's because of Jesus. I had an experience um, just last weekend um, of this very thing. I hosted a birthday party for a good friend of mine, and even though I hosted it at my house, she's the one who made up the guest list, and it was a very eclectic crowd. We had some girls from the gym. We had some girls from our neighborhood Bible study, and then she had some you know, childhood friends come, and we were all together, and at the end of the birthday party, we all took a moment just to give her a little toast and just tell her, um, what we thought about her, and it was so interesting because when we ran around the circle, you could clearly tell those who have been sitting under the word of God and those who had close, like, sisterhood relationship with her because it just came out in their speech. And when we went around the circle and it got to one particular girlfriend um, that we know, she was actually Jewish, and she said something along the lines of, you guys make me want to be more religious so I can have what you have. She actually said those words, and I thought, oh, that's what we're studying right here. And of course, all the Bible study girls pounced on that, right? <laughs> Join us. But, um, but I understood what she meant, you know, because isn't that true? Shouldn't, the, shouldn't people see the bond we have, the sisterhood that we share, and want to have that same kind of kinship and love and relationship, that koinonia fellowship? 
you know, in today's world, there's so much competition and comparison among women these days. And it's so nice to be able to come together, especially on a Thursday morning. We're coming together, and we're coming together to lift up the name of Jesus. We're magnifying his name. We're making a big deal out of him, not ourselves, which is the norm, right, in the world. Tell me about me. Tell me what you think about me. We're not doing that on a Thursday. We're, look, we're, look, we're looking to Jesus. But then as we do that collectively, what happens? Don't we ourselves get edified and we get encouraged in the faith, right? The Lord's so good to do that. But, you know, I, I knew what this gal meant when she said, you know, about being religious because I've heard that in the past where people say, oh, gosh, you're so religious. And you know what the Lord has graciously showed me it, how to respond? If I hear something like that, you know, I just say, you know, I'm not religious. I'm just in love with Jesus. And that way they know it's that, it's that love relationship with Jesus. And actually, it's been my personal prayer lately that I would be more bold to speak the name of Jesus, that the name of Jesus would just roll off my tongue, that it would be the sweetest thing on my lips, and that when I have an opportunity, I'm ready. I know what I'm going to say. I'm going to say it's because of Jesus and point to him. And then we see in verse 13 where Paul says, <clears throat> I love this because in my mind's eye, Paul is gathering together the Gentiles because he has something very specific he wants to say to them. And I can picture him kind of lowering his voice a little bit because this was a tactic I used as a first grade teacher. When my class was running wild and getting really loud, I didn't raise my voice to talk over them. I would get low and I'd say, if you can hear me, look in my eyes. And I would get their attention. And in my mind, I just see... I see Paul saying, okay, I have something so specific that I want to tell you. I do not want you to miss this. And he's going to tell them what their place is in this grand plan. And he wants us to have a proper perspective, and he wants us to have a right attitude about where our place is. Point number two is our place in God's plan. God has a plan, and now he's going to tell us our place in this plan. In verses 16 through 24, we find this genius metaphor of an olive tree, which symbolizes the nation of Israel. The root is God's promise to Abraham. The branches that were broken off were those of Israel, who by unbelief were removed from the tree. The wild olive branches, guess Guess, guess what, <laughs> what makes us? That's what we are. We're those wild olive branches that have been grafted in, the Gentiles. And how have we been grafted in? We've been grafted in because of our belief in Christ. And now we can partake of all the covenant blessings originally given to Israel. Do you get that? Do you understand that that's how we can so confidently look through the Old Testament and we could grab these promises and these jewels and these treasures and we can apply them to our own lives? Because we've been grafted in because of Christ, because of our belief. Now, all of those um, promises belong to us. And Paul turns from illustration to application. Because he wants us to learn from Israel's past mistakes, and he does not want us to repeat them. And as soon as he tells us our part, as soon as he tells us we've been grafted in, beware, because we might become all of a sudden spiritually proud, right? Because that's what happened to the Jews. But this is what he tells us in verse 18. He says, do not boast. Verse 20, do not be haughty. Verse 25, do not be ignorant. So why shouldn't we boast? Because there's no room for boasting. Because we don't support the root, but the root supports us. What do we have to brag about? What have we been given? What do we have that we haven't been given? Everything has been given to us by God and his grace. And did you know that God hates pride? And we can't take credit for what God alone can do. The only boasting that's acceptable is found in Jeremiah 9, 23, and 24, where it says, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, nor the rich man boast in his riches, nor the strong man boast in his strength. But if you're going to boast, boast in this, that you know me, 
that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness to the earth. In this, I delight. And then in verse 20, he says, do not be haughty. Another word for haughty is prideful, arrogant, conceited, but rather fear. And that word fear, we know, means to be in awe, to, rev to reverence God and all that God has done. And you know, that's actually the antidote for pride and arrogance. When we rightfully see God for who he is in his rightful position, high and lifted up, sovereign, majestic, transcendent, then we can't help be put in our proper perspective and we get knocked off our high horse, which we, never, we should have never been on in the first place, right? When we see awe, the awe of God, we're put in our rightful place. And then verse 25, do not be arrogant, ignorant, ignorant. Why? Because he wants us to know that the condition of Israel is temporary. It won't always be like this. He wants us to know that God still has a plan for the nation of Israel. So we know what not to do, but then he also tells us what we are to do. Do you see in verse 22, it says to consider, consider the kindness and sternness of God. We need a biblical and balanced view of God. Some people imagine God to always be severe, always angry, always upset, disappointed, ready to find fault, and, and just want to punish people. And such people need to understand the love of God through Jesus. But then there are others who imagine God is simply kind and generous and would never warn or rebuke anyone about anything. And they only think of him as loving and accepting and that somehow he turns a blind eye towards sin. And I fear that's the current climate of today. People equate the love of God with accept me, don't correct me, even when it's in direct contradiction to the word of God. See, God has revealed himself and his character through the scriptures, but if we don't know the God of the Bible, we'll imagine and we'll create a God of our own making. We'll just make him up as, he goes, as it goes along, what fits us, what fits our lifestyle, what fits the culture around us. But we need to stand on the word of God of how he has revealed himself through scripture. And Paul tells us that we need to consider or to notice. Another way of putting it is to think about and to appreciate both sides of God, his kindness and his severity which means his sternness, his intensity, or his exactness. And it's good for us to meditate on who God is, his character, and his attributes. And that's why I love at the end of our lesson each week where that Acts way of praying, we start with adoration. We start with declaring the attributes and the character of God. We're declaring who he is in light of what we've been reading A.W. Tozer said in his book, The Knowledge of the Holy, he says, I quote, the most important thing about us is what we think about God. The most important thing about us is what we think about God. What comes to your mind when you think about the kindness of God? I'm sure images come to your mind and and titles for him. And I just jotted down a few things. When I think about the kindness of God, I think he's my Abba Father who loves me. He's my good shepherd that leads me. He's the God who sees me and who will never forsake me. He's the Lamb of God who takes away not only the sin of the world, but he's taken away my sin and he's cleansed me. But then he's also the Lion of Judah. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's sovereign. He's transcendent. He's the, he's the Lord God Almighty, the commander of the armies of angels. He splits seas. He calms storms. He breaks chains. He shuts the mouths of lions. He conquers, delivers, and redeems, and he raises the dead. See, we need to know the kindness of God that allows us access to climb up in his lap 
and to cry on his shoulder. But we also need to know the sternness of God that condemns sin and will ultimately judge unbelief. In verse 22, Paul also tells us to continue in his goodness. Continue. Don't stop. Don't waver. Hold fast to Jesus and the things you know to be true. This is also a call for perseverance. You know, in that first metaphor where we're talking about the olive tree, uh, that's talking about nationally Israel. This is their place. Um, Collectively, this is where the Gentiles belong. But I love that Jesus gives us another illustration. And he talks about it in John 15, 5. And Jesus is saying, I am the vine, you are the branches. If my word abides in you, if you abide in my word and my word abides in you, then you will bear much fruit. And he makes it so simple for us to understand. He's doing it all. He's the vine. He's the source. You know what he asks of us? that we would just abide in him, which means just stay connected to him. That just means have an intimate, loving relationship with Jesus. And if we do that, then he's going to take care of all the rest. We are going to bear fruit because of that connection, that continuing with Jesus. So don't boast, don't be arrogant, don't be ignorant. The great plan of redemption is all by his grace. It's by grace we were saved. It's by grace we were called. It's by grace that we are kept. And it's by grace that God is able to graft us back in. He's got the power to graft people back in. That's what we learned in this chapter as well. What hope there is that God will welcome anyone, anywhere, and at any time, those who believe. So what does this teach us about the character of God? that he's long-suffering, that he's merciful, that he's gracious. I don't know if you know that I have a dog because I don't think I've ever talked about him. And all the opportunities, he's never come up in an illustration. But just the other day, uh, Dodger, my little 12-year-old, the way I describe him, he's very docile, slightly deaf, um, a little bit chubby because he's got a bit of a thyroid issue, but the sweetest little beagle. And the other day, he was just staring out the glass doors to the backyard, just looking longingly back. And Bob tells me, I think he wants to go outside, but he's probably afraid you won't let him back in. (laughs) Which is ridiculous because he's a house dog. And I said, well, if he has that fear, then it's completely unfounded. Because there's never been a time that he's outside and I've left him there if he's wanted to come back in. And as soon as I said those words, I was thinking, you know, I wonder how many people are on the outside. And they're just looking longingly to become part of this family of faith. And they might be thinking, but maybe I'm not good enough. I've sinned too much. They won't welcome me in. But isn't what we've been learning this whole time in the book of Romans, that it's not about our good merit. It's not about our behavior that gets us in right standing with God. But the only way to be right with God, the only way to be righteous, right with God, is through coming and just believing in Jesus. Paul has been revealing this great mystery that God right now is using Israel's temporary rejection until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in. Do you know that we're living right now where this is happening? We're living in the fullness. We're waiting for the fullness of the Gentiles to come in. But then there's going to come a day when Israel will turn back to God and embrace Jesus as their Messiah. He's speaking of an event that is still yet to be fulfilled. But we know that it's coming because God is faithful. And if he said it, it will come to pass. So I've labeled this hashtag, it's their destiny, right? Israel is going to come back. And our final point, and we're going to wrap this up really fast, is our rightful response in God's plan. And it's as though Paul gets to the top of this mountain that he's been climbing and he catches a glimpse of God's great plan of redemption for both the Jew and the Gentile and he can't contain himself. So what is he to do? It's what we all 
need to do. It's our only rightful response. At this point, he just worships and he gives God glory. And I can imagine Paul, whether he's standing and his arms are raised, or maybe at this point he drops to his knees, or maybe he's on his face, just laying prostrate before the Lord. And all he can do is worship and give God glory. And what does he say in verse 33? Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Will you pray with me? <clears throat> Lord, we come before you now, and, and Lord, that is our response. That is our only response to this wonderful um, mystery that you've been unfolding right before our very eyes. Lord, you are a great God with great plans and purposes and promises. And Lord, we want to trust you. We want to believe in you. That's why we're in Bible study, Lord, is to, to hear your word, to declare your word, to apply your word, to stand on your word. So God, I pray right now that whatever circumstances that my sisters find themselves in this morning, God, that we would trust in this great God of ours who has a plan, an individual plan for each and every one of us. Lord, develop those muscles of faith for each one of us, Lord. We love you, we love you, and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>